Well, welcome to another episode of HR Doctors. HR Doctors is a, a podcast webcast dedicated to bridging the divide. Uh, I feel that we're trying to provide solutions for better employee, employer, and job seeker connection. Really excited today to be joined uh, by Steve. Steve, thanks for being here. Tell our audience uh, a little bit about yourself. Hi, Brent. How are you? It's great to be on here. I am Steve Brown. Uh, I've been an on-purpose HR professional my entire career. Uh, I get the opportunity and the pleasure to be the Chief People Officer for La Rosa's Incorporated, and we're a regional pizzeria in the Cincinnati area. area. Cincinnati area? That's terrible. Uh, and uh, we're, we're an icon uh, when it comes to Cincinnati. People love our food, and our team members are amazing. Amazing. Well, when we connected, uh, you've obviously got a bit of a, of a presence on LinkedIn. You've got a newsletter that I'm fortunate to now be a part of, and you're there's some really great HR content. Uh, for those who don't know you, huge lover of lava lamps, uh, <laughs> which yes. I which I've enjoyed. And uh, when we first connected about you know some things we talk about, we talk about you know what we're currently facing. You know, part of the reason why I I started the HR Doctors webcast is as a uh, a recruiting and staffing company, we work with a large contingent specifically for us in Vancouver, but Express is almost mm -hmm. global. We're 900 offices in North America. Uh, and we obviously work with businesses to try to help them hire people. In the last five years for my company, we've placed over 11,000 people with 750 local Vancouver companies. And we're definitely hearing the challenges and struggles that those companies are faced with. We also obviously work with job seekers who are struggling as someone, and, and I mean, I'm sure for both of us who are active on LinkedIn, there is a lot going on there. It's probably the one of the greatest places to see visibility of what's happening, what people are a great place to share uh, what people are seeing uh, and employees as well. We're seeing this kind of, we, we just talked before we hit the record button about the pendulum swinging and how it's been in the employer favor for a long time. And then COVID was this almost linchpin that swung it over to the employee side. And yet still, it seems that even though there's this great demand that it hasn't maybe swung all the way to the job seeker side and that there's still challenges there. So what, what are you seeing? What do you feel that we're currently facing in the market right now? I think it's a mix of things, Brent. So there are still tons and tons and tons of jobs open. And what has happened is the labor shortage we projected back in 2020, which was supposed to, sorry, it was supposed to happen in 2020. They predicted it, predicted it in 2010. And then everything kind of fell apart financially, which is what we're going towards again, another financial challenge, another dip. So it's really crazy to see all these open jobs. And yet, I don't know what it is in Vancouver, but they say in the States, we have the lowest unemployment in history. Mm -hmm. So there are fewer people and you can't just create them, but you can be an employer where people want to work. So I think the workplace has shifted because employees finally are taking control of how they want to work, where they want to work and when they want to work. That's new. We are not used to that. Most people are like, I have jobs, let's fill them. Now it's the employee saying, I, I understand you have jobs, but this is what I want to do. And this is what I expect from an employer. Mm -hmm. and it's pretty, it is pretty non-negotiable. Uh, it's a good challenge, uh, but there's a balance now between employer and employee where it has in the past, like you said, been employer heavy, employee heavy. It's a balance now. Yeah. Do you, do you think there is a balance? Like, do you think it's 50-50? No, no. I still think it's very much in the employee's favor uh, because uh, people can choose where they want to go and how they want to work. And uh, my son is 25 and you know, he's choosing, I want to work here. I want to be remote. I want to do this. And if I don't find these things, I'm not working. So it's not, I'm not working there. I'm not working which is astonishing to me. Yeah. Uh, but he's sort of an example of people being much more in tune with what they want and what they don't want. In the past, um, all the things that we've tried to attract people with, better wages, which we should have, great benefits, which we should have, those are norms. Those are, that's in the door. Hey, you got to have that or I'm not coming to that. Now it's where I work, when I work, how I work. Uh, which is a new facet. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Uh, I feel that there are a number of factors that are creating friction on both sides. And I feel that it seems as though there isn't necessarily somebody who's taking ultimately responsibility of whose job it is to help ensure everybody's fully informed. I, I feel that for the most part, I mean, I've been in external talent acquisition and recruitment here in Vancouver for almost 15 years. Most, if not all of the companies that I've worked with, I would argue are, are you know, innovating and are adapting and are doing their best to treat their employees well. I, I, I can't think of an employer outside of the odd one-off who we don't work with where they're not a good employer that is run by a good person to the most part, you know, like most businesses and we work with a ton of nonprofits, we work with some government agencies, but most of them are capitalistic for-profit businesses. And I feel as of late, there's a huge like gap on the employer job seeker side where it's either never been discussed or it just doesn't equate to you until maybe you get further in your career that the transaction of employment between an employer and employee that the employer engages into this agreement with the end goal of making money. It's a profitable exchange for them. And if they don't, then the company ceases to exist. Right. And I think, I think that there's, I hate the word entitlement because I almost feel that it, it like absolves the employer job seeker responsibility and and I, I don't know if it's the right word, but I don't know if I have a better one at this stage. But it it almost feels like the the kind of feeling out there is that employment is entitled and it's just something that I should have. And I don't know if I should have to work hard for it. And I think there's a lot of people that don't fall in that category. There's some, I mean, my team's phenomenal. The teams we work with, there's some great people. Maybe is more the 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 struggling job seeker, and we get a ton of them where we get inundated with people that say, I'm looking for a job. And we go, great. What type of job are you looking for? And they go, couldn't tell you, isn't that your job to tell me the job that you have for me? And it's just like this feeling of, of, you know, I'm putting my hand up, say I want to work. It's your job to hire me and then show me what it is that you need me to do. And then I'll decide later whether or not I like it or not. And also whether or not I'm being paid fairly. And it's like, the, like, that's, it seems like that's part of the gap and divide where I feel like employers do want to hire people, but employees or job seekers don't always understand. And you talked about the benefits, you talked all these things, all these extra costs that go into this equation of employment, where it creates almost a greater barrier for new people to come in because there is such a high cost and that cost continues to grow mm -hmm. of just that entry point for an employee and then retention and the value exchange where once you've been in, it's going to take you, you know, depending on your organization, days, weeks, months to be able to create a return where the, the employer actually profits from that exchange and from that relationship. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I've, I've obviously tabled a whole bunch of stuff, but where, where does that kind of take you? I think the definition of work has changed and we have to change with it. I think the employers have responded. I absolutely believe that. I think there are quality people that work. One of the big misses though, I think is we look at talent at the front end of the funnel. So I work with Express, you guys do, you guys do great God stuff. You get me you know, candidates and I get them to work and then I get the next person and the next person and the next person. Talent happens once you land. Mm -hmm. So you should be talented coming in. That should be the big sell. But do I treat you as talent once you are in the organization? I don't know that organizations are doing that as well as we could because we're working and we're jumping all over it instead of saying, gosh, you know, uh, Rebecca is a great talented person. I'm using her in order to fulfill her need for all that she needs as an employee and I'll get the value from her. I don't look at it as return. I look at how can I drive value through performance and the return happens. ROI is legit, but I think it's a little backwards and old fashioned. If I can drive the value, I'll see the value. So um, the other thing that's big and changed dramatically, I've been at La Rosa's going on my 17th year. I've never been somewhere this long. I'm very thankful for that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but here's the thing. That's not normal anymore at all. Very true. So um, 
hiring people, TA people, recruiters, HR professionals, L&D professionals should say, for the time I have you, I'm going to make it rock. Right. For that life cycle, from the minute I recruit you and get you excited, to the minute you choose to leave or you leave or whatever happens, during that time, man, we're going to crush it. And it'll be valuable for you and we'll benefit from that. If we can position ourselves better that way as employers, I think it makes us more attractive because people see how they're adding value coming in. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely seen if we talk about, you know, the current state still, and you touched on a couple of great points there. I mean, some of the things we're going to dig into here are retention itself, which I think is a really important piece. Uh, you talked about employee life cycle, uh, and I loved your 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 context to it, which was thrive while you're here, which I think is such a fantastic way to look at that employee uh, life within the organization. And then, you know, as, as I've mentioned on a lot of these previous uh, webcasts, uh, I have a thing I like to call my three pillars, which is about how I feel companies need to work on their hiring and, and retention strategies, which is your vision, mission, vision, mission, culture, values, then your recruitment process, and then how you pre-board, onboard, and, and help, like you said, set one up, someone up for success. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges, especially from the visibility standpoint that we're seeing on LinkedIn that is creating a lack of trust through how it's being articulated, communicated is, I don't have the recent data, but I would argue there's probably 285,000 now, if not 290,000 people on layoffs, uh, dot, I think it's dot IO or whatever it is where, where you can go and see the real numbers. And that's only since 2023. I think at the beginning of the year, it was sub 260, you know, so we've seen a pretty high volume of people, um, or actually it was way lower than that, but a, a, a huge amount of layoffs that are happening. Uh, I think when I last looked, it was about 89% was in the US, only about 1% here in Canada. Um, obviously, Silicon Valley, uh, a couple different areas are huge hubs for, for tech innovation. Uh, I guess in terms of how that's being perceived by businesses, by employees, by by job seekers, by those people that have been laid off, like, I mean, you've got your, uh, the content you produce through your, through your newsletter and, and remind me again, what's it called? The HR net newsletter, the HR net, like, how are you seeing the ripple effects for both employers, job seekers, employees? Again, there's, there's kind of three different paths to go down there, but what's your sense of, of how that's affecting the landscape? Oh, I think it's going to have a dramatic, uh, impact because it's the next wave of uncertainty. Yeah, we we want to breathe and go. Ah, oh, things are good, and then mash. You know, bank failures, layoffs in tech. And even though you're not, you may not be directly involved. It gives you that next level of, well, you know, do I have security? Do I have the ability to keep my job? Am I next? Is that coming to my company? So for current employees, they're wondering what the state of things are. For incoming employees, they're like, well. You know, I didn't expect this. When I hear the number thousands in the news, you're like, what does that even mean? You know, we have 900 team members. And when we say we're leaving off thousands of people, what is it, Meta laid off 10,000 and, and closed 5,000 job openings? That's staggering to me. Yeah. So the thing I don't like about it, though, Brent, is there's no context. So that's 10,000 out of how many? Still 10,000 people that were affected, and that's awful. But out, out of how many? We don't, we give partial snapshot data and it drives the needle too much. So uh, I'm seeing more uncertainty. I'm seeing uh, a little fear again uh, now, especially around the employment contract or the employment relationship and, uh, people have with employers. At the same time, like I mentioned before, people will still do what they want to do. Uh, so it's very difficult from the employer side to try and get a good gauge as to how does this work? Because honestly, every hire is different. Uh, not that it hasn't been in the past, but I think there's more volatility and more uncertainty every person we place. Yeah. I uh, I mean, it would be great to have a crystal ball to truly understand like what factors are are triggering these mass changes in the market. Um, 
you know, we can only speculate so much, mm -hmm. but as I shared at the onset, I really feel that, you know, as we've, as we kind of discussed that the, the, there was this pendulum swing when COVID hit, right. Mm -hmm. And, and not for blue collar as much, but for white collar, a opportunity for people to take stock as we're faced with, you know, a bit of like a mortality complex of, of looking at what truly is important to ourselves. And in positions where people are highly functioning, high contributors, and ultimately creating value in that profitable exchange equation, we're able to, I think, um, whether it was negotiate or whether it was just kind of say, this is what I'm going to do. And obviously that pendulum swung. I mean, tens of maybe even 20 or 30, 40 years ago, employment was about survival. You know, people would work for terrible companies and companies didn't have to invest, you know, HR. I don't even know if that existed back then. It was just a, you know, uh, a leader somewhere whose job was to make sure you were productive as possible. And if you weren't, you were released from the company and there is a line of people outside looking for, for opportunities. And that has obviously changed. We're seeing so many different factors that are impacting businesses where they're then going, okay, what do we need to do? And I think there's been an extremely positive transition where HR has become more of a thing. Businesses have invested in growing those departments, focusing on DEI, focusing on employee wellness, mental health, well-being, you know, obviously giving employees the opportunity to work remote and ask for more and be more flexible. You know, part of me would argue that some of these tech companies that for a long time went crazy with compensation and with mm -hmm. added employee perks that weren't part of the equation. You know, it's not, I do this job and I get paid or whatever, let's call it a hundred grand, but also as a company, we're going to have personal trainers. We're going to have chefs. We're going to have crazy overhead. We're going to have unbelievable offices with all these different things that we're going to do. And eventually at some point, you know, you can only do that for so long before mm -hmm. that's no longer a profitable exchange. You know, inflation's a, a, an issue that everybody is impacted by, employee wages going up, increased benefits, all these different things. And then the constant need for companies to innovate, I feel it has to be a part of it. I, I'm sure, sure that profitability at the end, or maybe it's, uh, you know, shareholder value and stock value and things like that, that are, you know, well over my head and you'd have to be in the boardroom to truly know what's triggering those decisions. But I just, I just wonder if like part of this is the pendulum swung and now the employers who had control where they were going, we're going to, we're going to bring the best talent in. We're going to bring the most desirable people and we're going to pay crazy rates. And then social media and the ability for everybody to share then has this ripple effect where companies everywhere go, well, if I want to compete for the best people, I got to try to keep up with these things. Even if I'm out of, you know, I'm not in that space. I'm a law firm and I'm an accounting firm, but we're going to, we're going to try and do these crazy things to try to show our employees how much we value them. And then now the pendulum swinging back and the companies are going like, you know what, like we've overhired on purpose and we've given all these perks and benefits and we're going to maintain them. But for us to, you know, kind of stay profitable, whatever that looks, maybe profitable is we need to be making billions mm -hmm. and the typical employee would go, can't, you know, couldn't you just be okay with millions? And, you know, do you have to lay us off or could you not just make less? And, you know, especially in the U.S. where capitalism is this, you know, massive driver, maybe more so than in Canada, as much as we're really close, you know, that 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 may be a huge factor where they're going, you know what, we're we're, we're going to force that pendulum back now. I agree. I, I think those are a lot of mitigating factors. The It reminds me of the stock market. The stock market, when it's out of balance, makes a correction. So we're about to have a correction. And there could be all kinds of reasons, but when employers see that window of correction, they make cuts. What I'm afraid is some will make cuts too deep in yeah. order to get through the storm, yeah. in order to come back on the other side, or they'll make a correction that they should have made back when they made all these investments and did things on wages or perks or things like that. Um, but the correction happens all the time. This is the correction of 2023. So now, you know, we'll write it our ship, see what happens, and go forward. But the points that you made on your three pillars still are in play. Yeah. So uh, it, it's it's not a matter of getting swallowed by all the correction that's occurring. It's how do I perform in the midst of it and get through it, so it's the best for my people and our company. Right. 
Yeah, and we can we can dig in here as we go to the retention piece, the employee life cycle, which may be a really good segue, and then the the pillars coming to life. But you know, based on what we're seeing right now, uh, and and hopefully we can talk first to the employer, then to the employee, and then the job seeker. Like, what would you suggest? We're faced with uncertain times right now. Uh, you know, there's uncertainty in the market. Like, I don't know if the best thing to do is speak specifically to what your organization's doing or more hypothetically to what you'd suggest of businesses out there that aren't, let's say you're not in this IT space, but there's uncertainty. How how would you suggest like businesses right now, whether it's from an HR to a general perspective, what would your suggestion be on how they kind of navigate the the constant changes that we're faced with? I think the first thing you need to speak to all the time is security. And security mm. is, I have a job. Because people really won't care what's going on until they know what security is, not promises. Like, here's where we are financially. This is the current outlook. This is our three-month look ahead, not our two-year look ahead. Be more reasonable. Pull that in a little and say, as a part of this, you are a part of my company. Once you're secure, you say, how are you contributing? And you ask that. Not just expect it. Have a conversation with people. Uh, both from the employer standpoint and the employee standpoint and the job seeker standpoint. How are you going to bring what you do and make us better? I don't mm-hmm. hear a lot of people t- do that. Uh, one of the big shifts I'd love to see on the job seeker and the employer side is quit hiring to a job description specifically because people play and match the bullet points. You say, I'm looking for these four things. And the candidate says these four things. You're like, that's the best person ever. And we make these long-term decision or hopefully long-term decisions instead of saying hey Brent it it looks like you have a solid background how are you going to take what you do and bring that to our company and make us better have more of that conversational side to things Uh, I don't see employers doing it we are trying to do it Uh, but it's a big shift because people are still in the mindset of I lack this many people. I need to find this many people instead of saying, what's the right number of people to have so that there is security and there is ability to do well. And there is ability to grow and develop. Uh, HR and TA need to be a little more mindful of the business side of hiring, the business side of talent, instead of just looking at the numbers, the budgets and the job descriptions. What do you, th- I mean, I, I, I'm i a huge fan of performance-based hiring. I definitely find, uh, I had a great chat with Lou Adler a couple of weeks back. Oh, His yeah. episode will get posted pretty soon. And he's got some phenomenal stuff on performance-based hiring uh, that totally changed my view on how I approach some of the conversations I have. But how, how do you get away from hiring to the bullet points when you're hiring a position that is very much a bullet point position? Like if it was, you know, uh, someone who's going to be making pizzas. Oh, I, I give you a great example. Um, when you work for us, you start, you're usually 16 years old. Right. So the, the interview is automatically different because when you, we don't remember when we were 16, but you didn't know how to talk about work. You didn't know how to talk about things. So we talk about tactical things. But my thing is, hey, Brent, tell me about a time at school where you worked with somebody who was difficult. Mm. Because, or I mean, we work in a fast pace. Do you have examples of when you've worked in a fast pace at school, at home, in your uh, community involvement? Help people and guide them through the interview instead of expecting them to respond. I, I think it, generating conversations allows you to make better decisions. And so you're looking for attitude, character, reliability. That's true, whether it's a frontline pizza cook at 16 years old. Or uh, the director of marketing. <laughs> you know, you want those types of things. If we would spend more time talking about the person, uh, a typical interview in a pizzeria, Brent, is 15 minutes. Because yeah. we're hiring you to make a pizza. But we right. want it to be a great experience for you. We want it, you know, the employee experience is as important coming in uh, as it is for anybody who's in a high level position. Um, I think more of us need to take that people-centric look at things instead of the process-centric look at things. So you can cover all the stuff on the bullet points through conversations. You just don't have to do match the dots. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, 
ultimately for those that maybe don't know, those were behavior based questions that you're digging into of situations that someone's encountered before versus trying to get someone, especially in a situation where they have no relevant or any work experience to bring to the table or highlight. And it's really just about trying to understand if faced with a certain situation, how would they deal with it? Uh, and I mean, as a, you know, as a staffing and recruitment company, I mean, we work with frontline people in jobs where, you know, you don't need to have a resume to apply and the work that you've done for the most part isn't super important as long as you're willing to do this type of work and you know what you're getting into. But then we also are faced with situations where we've got clients that are looking to hire for, you know, specific roles in their organization and 100% get stuck into like, this is what the person needs to accomplish. And these are the specific background experiences and years of experience and types of companies and really limit their ability to hire. Right. And I, I mean, I would argue for the most part, the reason for that is because they're looking to eliminate risk. Right. And this sure. still goes back into the barriers that make it hard for job seekers, which is, you know, I think the further up the ladder you go, the longer it can potentially take to get someone up to speed, because even if they are from your industry and have experience, they still need to learn your company, your way, you know, figure out how your customers look to be, you know, served or whatever it may be. Higher compensation means a longer path for the company get, to get the return. And so ultimately, there are these like massive processes that get built into the recruitment process. And I don't feel I mean, I've seen so many posts lately about like, you know, companies, you should just give people a chance and just hire people and don't like make them run through the ringer. And, and it's like, I mean, I could I could count like within the within this year probably five different situations where a client of mine has come to me and said, Brent, I hired somebody and this crazy scenario was going on. What do I do? Like, I need to let this person go and I don't know how to do it. And I'm really scared that if I do it the wrong way, it's going to blow up in my face. And, and so there's this like, you know, there's, again, there's this disconnect, right? It's the whole point of the show, <laughs> but I a hundred percent agree. I mean, I think, I think that, you know, if, if we're talking to the employers out there, one of the biggest things, the biggest factor I've seen, and you address it super well, there is the skill gap, mm -hmm. right? It's that companies want to hire people and mitigate risk by hiring people who have direct experience and skill from their industry and know that, you know, if I'm a commercial real estate developer and I'm hiring a CFO and the person's coming from commercial real estate development, that they're not going to come in here and be here for six months and then go, you know what? I'm a great CFO, but commercial real estate's not for me. You know, like the hope is, is that they're going to, you know, again, what, I mean, maybe that's a bad example, but you take someone out of hockey and put them in basketball and go, you're a star athlete. And they go, oh man, like you should have left me in hockey because I'm not a basketball player. Right. So there's that, like that way, but then obviously there are, you know, potentials of whatever it may be. If someone's a super high achiever, is there a way that you can slot them into their organization and that person can elevate your, your team and help you mm -hmm. win better. And I would argue that there absolutely is. And that if you're just trying to stick within your space, your niche, or look for people that possess these, you know, as we call them in the industry, these unicorn skills, that you're just massively limiting yourself and ultimately who's responsible to solve that problem for you. Right. And I, I would argue that companies have been innovating and they will hire. And it really ties into what, you know, you've mentioned is almost probably like a massive part of what you guys are required to do to be able to hire is that you're not looking for direct, relatable, transferable industry experience and just looking for great people that are looking for great opportunities. Yeah. I, specific example. Uh, we hired our director of marketing after our last director of marketing moved into a different role. Uh, and she had been in that role for 20 plus years. We have stupid turnover. Sorry, stupid <laughs> tenure. We have great, we have low turnover. We have yeah. Stupid tenure. Um, so, you know, the prior person did a great job, new opportunity. So I sat down with the EVP of marketing. I said, what do you want to do? He says, I want a good person who's a marketer. That was it. And I said, what do you think? <laughs> he, he, says, he, goes, he goes, let's hire without a job description. I said, okay. So this is what happened very qualified people, including people who had done marketing in the restaurant industry, chose not to apply because they couldn't answer the bullet points. Mm. The person we hired 
we sat down, we said, hey, we're going to really make a huge shift organizationally and let you define what marketing should be. How would you do that? And the person we hired, we found out she was strategic because she showed us. She was a critical thinker because she showed us. Mm. She was all these things because she showed us. And we hired her. It's great. Then she was able to bring someone on in her staff. And I said, here's the rule. No job description. And she says, what? I said, we brought you on. Let's try it. So we hired an entry-level college student for a brand new coordinator position. Same thing. Found great people. We knew in the background, Brent, what we needed. We looked for what they came to the table with. And so the gap wasn't that big. It was a marketing person. We didn't hire somebody without marketing background. Sure. Okay. So, but it wasn't specifically to what we do uh, because I never would have been hired. I never worked for a restaurant company. Right. No. Uh, but I've worked with people. So they wanted to hear what do we do with people? Um, there's great talent out there. I think the things you mentioned about making narrow decisions harm us and cause a lot of angst and frustration that we can avoid by saying, am I being too narrow? If we would step back a little bit as a profession and say, gosh, I'm just struggling. I wonder if I'm the one who's narrow. I wonder if I'm the obstacle as an employer. Um, I don't know how many posts I've seen on LinkedIn or Twitter where they said, hey, looking for this IT professional. I applied through the link, and the minute I got the link, they sent me to another resume, uh, fill in the blank, and then another one, and then another one, and I still haven't got to talk to anybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just, uh, the more hoops we make people walk through, the difference is candidates won't tolerate it anymore. Yeah. E even, if the, even if they need that job, they'll go, if this is how I'm going to be treated, that's the culture of the company, I'm out. Can you hear the uh, the sirens that are going by me right now? No, no, okay, no. Well, my microphone's great. No, I just in my <laughs> my building downtown again. There's something going on downstairs. It's awesome. Oh uh, no, 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 no. I, I made a couple really great points there. I have a couple different questions that I want to dig into with you. One is, so you've hired a uh, a marketing director, or manager, uh, and also a person beneath that. How do, as an organization, you hold that person accountable to their role, to what they need to deliver? How do you performance manage them? Not from a, like, you are or aren't doing your job, but from whether it's an annual review perspective, like we have some really well-defined descriptions internally that we don't use to advertise for our positions. We definitely take a different approach there, but we have a very clear kind of pathway of if you don't have the skills and ex or you don't have the experience and knowledge, then this is where you would come in. And this is what a really skilled and experienced person looks like. And if you're here, mm -hmm. when you come into the organization, then you get compensated this. And if you're mm -hmm. here, then here's the clear path on how you get there. And it's sure. been really great for my team where the, the review conversations are really easy. When I do performance reviews with my team, it's almost like it's not a conversation. It's just Brent, hey, we've been talking. I've, I've checked this last box. I go, awesome, sweet. You know, expect the piece of paper in a couple of weeks. Um, but how, if you don't, do you have an internal after the fact or do you just have, you got nothing that clearly defines the role and it's like a feeling or how do you kind of manage through that? Well, it's a great question. We're kind of a, a different organization because we know our people inside and out. We're small enough that we can do that. Um, we do this. We set expectations for the role both for those that manage others and for those in the role. So if you're a people manager, you need to have an expectation conversation with your people on an irregular basis. And they know what's expected of me, what's not. And if something goes off the farm, which it does, you jump in and you talk about it right away. We don't have a formal system to look at um, development. We expect development on an ongoing basis. So our development is individualized because when I work with Julie, Julie's development is different than Rebecca's, which sure. is different than Gary's. So from a systematic standpoint, our big thing is consistent conversations, talk about expectations. And, and my boss set the standard for me when I first started at La Rosa's. He said, uh, here are my expectations of you. What are your expectations of me? Now, most companies do boss to subordinate. Here's what I expect from you, the person that works for you. Hey, 
hit these numbers, do these things, all good stuff. But on the other side, if I'm truly going to shepherd and lead my people, I need to hear from what you expect. So can I meet that? Can I not? Is it unreasonable? It anchors people more, and the people who are anchored stay. Uh, the people who aren't anchored and float leave. It's pretty simple, but it takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of more individual HR versus collective HR. We have very, very few things that are collective across the whole workforce. We're much more individually based um, and our retention is crazy. Yeah. Not, a, not our turnover. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, you touched on, uh, on a piece about the candidate experience. Uh, and, and again, we'll tie a bit into after the fact into the employee life cycle and thrive while you're here. I think that's a great conversation piece on its own. Uh, but, uh, Express is a franchise. We have, you know, ISO certified processes and all these different things. In my office, we've stopped using our online applications. It was a, a hugely arduous and frustrating process for job seekers. And I mean, the evolution, my, my office has been open for seven years here in Vancouver when we first opened. And this model still exists for a lot of offices. And I think in the areas that some are in, it is hugely successful, but it was a, an open door walk-in uh, a lot of the uh, the initiative was to bring as many people in as possible, mm. get a beehive of activity going, have a team of recruiters that are there to interview everybody right then and there. And then you try to get all those people or as many people as you can out working on whether it's day or week long or month long or permanent assignments. And then and then technology became a little bit more like prevalent and it became, okay, we're going to make the experience easier for you because when you came in, you had to fill out an online, you had to fill out an application in person. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, well now you can fill in an online application before you come in. But even still, I mean, if we had whatever the percentage is, even if it was a 10% higher rate, that means out of a hundred people, 90 of them are filling out an application and not getting a job. And like the process is unenjoyable. I mean, even creating a resume is such a, a frustrating process for a lot of people. And it's not, it's not like a critical job for somebody who's not going to be working at a computer all day. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel that there are a lot of unnecessary hoops that companies make people jump through, but there are also very necessary hoops that companies make people jump through. And I think, again, this is another thing where the waters get muddied and people don't understand. There's not, there's not a, like a great ability for companies to always articulate these things. And as a result, it just creates this further divide. And again, I, I feel like it should be the school's job or the government or something like it's not like it should be the business's job to say, and I still think companies do. I think they'll say we've got a, a you know a three or four interview process and this is what it looks like, but you still don't get full transparency and, and visibility because, you know, they can't, they can't always give that to everybody. Mm -hmm. Um but you, you talked about the process you guys have. And again, whether it's yours or, or just general suggestions for others, like what, what do you think are maybe best practices or things you guys have implemented or seen that haven't worked or wherever it may be in mm. terms of that like initial candidate experience? I think it's a great set of questions, Brent. Here, here's what we did. We went traditional. Here's the online. Here's the assessment you have to fill online, even yeah. if you're a frontline person, mm -hmm. because it, it, it gave us viability and you know a screen to people and stuff like that it was all legit valid stuff and it was a stumbling block we had people who wouldn't finish the application and our first take was well if they won't fill out the application then they're just not a good person well how what how do you know that our, is our process in the way so we skinnied well, it down is it not that they're not a good person, but more just if they're not willing to do oh. this kind of like task that we're giving sure. them, then when we give them their job, which is nothing but tasks, how are they yes. going to approach that? Yes. Right? Like, I, I feel like that's the mindset. Oh, I think it's, there should be some skin in the game, but not all the skin in the game. Yeah. So go through this, get through this. Now, if you're not willing to do this limited piece, then yes, then you're showing me your character, your, your approach towards work, that kind of stuff. You can make that quick jump in that assumption. But what we did was we said, okay, can we do it through the phone instead of the computer? So we went from paper to computer to phone. Uh, we're going to do onboarding very soon through our phone. We're doing everything where people are. So it's much more candidate focused 
than it is employer focus. We'll still get the same information, but instead of our process being a hindrance to somebody, it's a door to the next step for them working for us. Right. So that's how I've tried to talk to my team of how do we make sure that there are no barriers, there's doors. Application, great. Uh, one interview, maybe two, even at the pizzeria level. Uh, because we want to get to know you and we want you to know us. Right. We want, and we want to have some time to tell you what the job really is. I think that's so important. Not And, and try to be as transparent as possible. Hey, uh, our Friday nights are busy. You're going to be on your feet eight to nine hours at a time. Uh, it is hectic. It's uh, There's a lot of noise going on. And tickets just print, 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 print. And it's like, I, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, come on, let's walk in the kitchen. Let me show you. Yeah, you know, those types of investments in time show candidate experience by having people not just have a conversation in a booth or at a desk or online. They get to understand what really the nature of the job is. And that was a new shift for us. In the past, it was higher bodies, higher bodies. Now we're trying to say, here's the job so that we have a better chance of retaining them when they start. So we're trying to be consistent. It's hard. And sometimes the pressures of the day, the pressures of not having enough people uh, force you to circumvent that and to cut, do shortcuts. But the best we can do, we try and make it uh, candidate focused so that they choose us because they don't have to choose us. Right. They can choose somebody else. We want to be the employer that they choose. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of employers out there too. Um, that maybe miss a lot of great opportunities where they're maybe not as aware or focused on the candidate experience mm -hmm. and they know that it's a, a thing. And I see again, I keep going back to LinkedIn, but so much about how candidates complain about being ghosted or that they're asked to go through like a multi-step process and then get no feedback at the end of it mm -hmm. um, or that they're asked to do work projects or whatever it may be. I think there's massive validity. I work with a ton of different clients. And in fact, we have our own processes where if we hire someone internally, it's generally like a three-step process for us, maybe even four, a mm -hmm. basic 15 first chat an interview about your actual like technical capabilities in your resume, a behavior one to assess fit and review our culture and core values and see how you see yourself aligning. And then maybe like a team or a last piece, if there's any kind of like, you know, issues, but I think it all depends on the role. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I assume that the maybe takeaway is just uh, as we continue to evolve, as it becomes harder to hire good people, it's probably just a good practice to go back and look at your process and see if there are roadblocks that you're creating for yourself. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of companies will argue that they're happy with the roadblocks because if it means that they miss out on hiring bad people for their mm -hmm. organization, that if it means they maybe miss out on a good person, that they're okay with that. And in this market, like that may not be like the best approach. I, I also look from a job seeker perspective, um, that, you know, from our organization, I can share that we we probably on average get somewhere between, I think 500 is a low number. We probably get close to a thousand applicants a week uh, in our organization. I mean, we've got nine different divisions in, in my company here. Uh, and within those applications, I mean, that that is simple as a hundred applicants a week for 10 open positions, right? I mean, we don't get that many, but it does happen. You know, I would argue more than half of the people applying for jobs put little to no effort in submitting a resume that looks like they've put any time, effort, or energy oh, into it. Agree. And and for you know frontline roles or blue collar, I stress to my team and to our clients that if you like if, if building a resume isn't a critical like transferable skill, if they're not going to be heavily reliant on a computer, let's say it's for a, an electrician or a carpenter, why do we even care what the resume looks like? You know, it's not a critical skill. However, if you're applying for a like a marketing manager, your resume should look amazing. Sure. You know, like your job is branding, it is selling. If you're a CFO and you're or a high level finance individual, and you are a professional who is going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, working on the success or failure of the financial aspects of the business, you better be able to demonstrate through your application and your resume that you put the time, effort and energy into this and that everything that you do comes with great attention to detail 
and that you're purposeful, purposeful in it. You see the like value in this part of the process. And I would argue that regardless of the role, there was always going to be like, you know, a scale. If a hundred people apply, then, you know, everybody is going to be able to be ranked between one and a hundred mm -hmm. and how you present yourself is a choice that you make as a job seeker and companies will ask you to jump through hoops and they will have work for you to do or projects or testing or whatever you do. And that if, if you're not putting a hundred percent of your effort into it, I argue it's either because you're just applying for jobs for the sake of applying for them. And that if you were truly inspired and motivated in a particular field, a job, or role that you'd probably put more into it, or that you just don't understand those barriers that are against you. And that if you're not fighting to be one of those top five or 10% or whatever that number is, that you're hurting your chances. And that's one of the greatest challenges I see. And again, the biggest struggle for us is I want to help these people. I want to mm -hmm. tell them, but it's, it's almost like not our place. And if we do, sometimes that feedback is met with great adversity resulting in people who then get a negative perception of us because they're, they're going, why are you giving me homework? Just give me the job. And it's like, you know, for us, we don't get to make the final choice. If I could place right. everybody who came through my doors, I'd be retired already you know, but we don't, it's my clients who decide ultimately who they're going to hire. And we work with them to manage their expectations. And we work with our candidates that come through that we're able to submit. But in large part, we get given a list of requirements or expectations. And if you don't meet them, or you don't show up in a way that portrays your ability to succeed in the role, demonstrate those behaviors you originally talked about when you interview somebody, then you're, you're hugely hurting your chances before and, and could be the reason why you don't even get a call back. And I think a lot of people, and, and again, I feel like it's this disconnect and I feel like it's someone's job, but, you know, don't know if it's necessarily a hill I'm willing to die on to be like job seekers, you know, you guys are the reason you're having the problem. Like, I feel like it's either the education system or the government or somebody who, or, or is it just you as a job seeker? It's your job when you graduate to be introspective and go to Google and go to YouTube and go to all these places and go, how can I be the best job seeker? You know, like. I don't know how are you how are you finding the the like the the general applicant or the general approach and well one of the things that I do is I facilitate an HR roundtable and we have people who are in transition and they they can come and what I find is a, a lot of what you're saying some people say I just want a job well cool what steps are you taking to do that mm. hey, uh, do you have a network well I, I don't need a network well you do because you're here. And you know, no one's, there are few people teaching them what to do. They just want to have that security, that paycheck and stuff again. And I understand that, but that's not the lead because what we try to emphasize uh, at the round table is let's get you healthy. Once right. you get healthy, man, you, you get hired within moments because you're already talented, but People are trying to figure out as job seekers, the mechanisms of a company instead of how to present themselves, do the work that's required of them, and then be considered. And if it's too much of a hoop, then you don't have to work there. Yeah. You can, you can sit through the other side you can say, hey, boy, this was too much of a process. I don't think I'm going to go. You go, all right. Well, then what are you looking for? I also don't know, Brent, that job seekers do a good enough analysis of Here's what I'm looking for in a company. Here's what I'm not going to tolerate in the company. 100%. It, and, and if they did that simple assessment online, uh, on a Word document or on a piece of paper, they'd be light years ahead of every other job seeker that chooses not to do that simple thing. Well, a lot 100%. Of, a lot of, yeah, a lot of self-awareness that's not there. Um, some of it is I'm talented. Well, I, I love the numbers you gave. Those are wonderful numbers. Well, think of the odds. Just do the odds from that. I want to be the one person out of the 100 that you choose. Yeah. If I have that mentality going in as a job seeker, I'm far ahead of, I just need a job. It has to change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, it's, 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 it's very uh, aligned to a lot of the, the previous guests that I've had on and it ties so perfectly into my three pillars of what I call the successful hiring retention for businesses because I feel the same three pillars exist for the job seeker. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, the first is the culture, vision, mission, and values. And as a job seeker, if you don't have your own mission and the vision that you're on and have your own set of values, I think you and I would both, and, and most employers would welcome an application from somebody where they said, Hey there, I saw this position open. This is who I am. This is the path that I'm on. This is where I want to go. This is the type of work that I'm interested in. If this aligns with the role that you're looking to hire for, then I'd love to speak with you guys. And that if I don't get the call back as the job seeker, then I don't go, oh, this sucks. I lost another one. I go, oh, good. Like this company wouldn't have been a fit for me. Right. Right. But it, it, it seems way more transactional where it's it's just you know resumes coming in which hurt all the job seekers like again if we get 100 resumes it it i mean that the the rule of thumb in the industry is the typical recruiter takes 6 seconds to review a resume before they wow. determine whether or not that they move on and i mean i don't think there's like huge validity to that but i do think if you know someone applies to us here in Vancouver and the jobs in Vancouver and you're from Texas you know, unfortunately, we don't have the ability and our clients won't hire somebody to then have you relocate. Like there's just too much you need to be based here. So Mm -hmm. there are candidates that are easily eliminated. And if you aren't able to articulate your value and why you are deserving of that call back, then you're not going to get it. And I really think, again, if, if, if you don't feel like you can put yourself into that top tier and it doesn't always have to be by matching the bullet points, you know, like I think, you know, I see lots out there of, Hey, if you see a job and you don't think you qualify for it, you should still apply for it. I'm sure you and I both could think of countless situations where we've hired someone who is underskilled or under knowledge mm-hmm. based on a role, but was a great person who applied in a like a, in a unique way that was able to articulate why they would be a suitable person to select and turn into a phenomenal person. And I right. think that's even the baseline of, I mean, for me, it's what we hire the most here is people who are high aptitude and high motivation sure. and their previous experience isn't necessarily the most critical. And I even even to the point where when I hire an internal team member here, uh, we use Indeed a lot and there's screening questions on it. And we'll put one of the screener questions is tell me something that's not on your resume. And 70, 80, 90 percent of the responses are I'm a team player. I'm, you know, highly motivated. Those people don't get calls back because that's like anybody can say that the people get calls back are the people that go like, I love sushi or, you know, like (laughs) I have three dogs, a cat and a lizard. You know, like, like, it's like, okay, awesome. Like, you're not just answering the question for the sake of answering the question. You're going, this is, this is a way for me to kind of show you who I am as a person. And that's what ultimately we want is, you know, good people, not just someone who thinks they're going to say something because it's what we want to hear. And I think, again, it's the, it just, it's, it's hard out there for job seekers. And I really suggest that you have your own vision of, Mm -hmm. of what you want for yourself and try to find a way to either apply to companies that truly align, or it doesn't always have to be this direct, perfect alignment. But if you know what you want in your career, that if you can tell them, this is what I want and try to identify if that aligns, then great. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. From from the company side, we talk about that first pillar, uh, vision, mission, culture, values, uh, How, how, like on a scale of one to 10, how important is that for, for your organization? I think it defines us. Uh, You know, we, we say two things. Um, uh, We are people first and we are. And the second thing is we believe in reaching out and make smiles because we serve pizza. I mean, doggone. (laughs) If, if you're not going to smile with pizza, that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. but those those baseline things that as a company, this is who we believe and what we act on, the people first. And the reason is this is what we do it for. It's very simple. And so uh, a 16-year-old can understand it. And so yeah. can somebody who's been in the business for a while. Uh, I think clarity and simplicity when it comes to culture, vision, mission is far more attractive uh, it, because it's just easy to understand. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, HR doctors is our core values. It's helpful, resourceful, driven, relentless, sensible. We established it. I want to say three, four years ago, maybe longer. And through it has come our hiring process, how we make decisions internally in our business, and the HR doctors webcast. You know, podcast stemmed from that foundation of of helping people and trying to find a way to 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 bridge that divide. So I just feel like it's such a critical piece. And I think, as we alluded to, that 
whether it's the business. And I think it's it's critical for the business to have that clear vision, the mission, the culture, the values, because that helps you go to market. It helps you hire. Oh, um, yeah. And then, you know, we talked about my, you know, as a recruiting and staffing company, the recruitment process is one that we, you know, focus on the most out of that process. But one of the things that uh, we talked on that I think is a great point as we kind of lead towards the end of our chat is the retention piece mm. and the employee life cycle. And for me, that third pillar is how you like pre-board somebody before they even start your organization and they've accepted an offer with you, how you onboard them, how you set them up for success. And I had a great chat uh, recently where uh, we talked about like an 80-20 split, a 50-50 and an 80-20, where mm. who's responsible for the, the life cycle in the beginning in the vision, mission, culture values, it's 80% on the employer sure. and then kind of 20% on the employees within when it comes to the recruitment process, it should be 50, 50. It should be, this is what we want from an organizational standpoint. And this is the role, but as a job seeker should be 50, 50 where mm -hmm. you're coming and you're kind of looking for what you want in an organization. As you onboard somebody, same thing, 80, 20 to start, then it balances to 50, 50. And then eventually it's your job as the employee where you need to be more responsible for your path, your development, as you talked about before. Uh, so I'm interested to hear what your like thoughts or approach are on who's responsible, what stages. But uh, the the piece I'll, I'll trigger you on is that you shared this great piece, which is the employee life cycle and thrive while you're here, knowing that people although you have this amazing call or amazing retention that there are lots of people that will be there for a season, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for short time for a couple of years and, and move on to better bit or not better, but other things. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. What, what is your kind of view on that retention and life cycle? I think if you're people focused, you'll have more of a retention mindset. If uh, a lot of companies still are on the turnover thing and, um, you know, let's reduce our turnover because it's affecting our costs. And it is. But looking on the proactive side and the front end of things, uh, I think makes a better opportunity and the math works out at the end where you see much better numbers. So uh, we want the employee experience to be great from the time you enter a restaurant to the time you're hired. And not only your first day, but your second day and your third day and your yeah. fourth day. Uh, first day, uh, excitement is easy. Second day is harder because you can't ignore the person and go back to work. So from an HR standpoint, we keep working with those that are people managers to say, how's your team? How's your team? How's your team? And I want to hear stories. I want to hear, oh, Brent, uh, I talked to Mike yesterday and this happened. If I hear that, I know you're on top of it mm. and retention will happen. Um, then the other thing is uh, having people have a safe way to talk about concerns or uh, ways when they are, just don't know what's going on. They have uncertainty. If people have that safe outlet, either through their manager or through HR, then we'll know ahead of time. Very rarely are we surprised that someone's leaving. Yeah. If some, it, when someone's ready to go, we kind of know it. They kind of know it. And it's kind of a natural thing. Um, a good friend of mine, Karitha Rushing, when I was on the Sherm board with her, said this, and she worked for Equifax. And I, and I asked her if I could steal it. Uh, Red carpet in, red carpet out. Yeah. So um, you can't just get me in and get me all excited and recruit me, treat me well while I'm there. And then when I leave, help me leave with grace. And, I'll, and I will talk about you forever. I will talk about my experience with you. I'll actually help recruit because I'm going to have other people say, oh, I worked at La Rosa's and it was amazing. We have years and years and years of these wonderful stories that for the time they were there, it was wonderful. Um, so it's helped us kind of frame our culture. The thing that's also done is with the new workforce and the new approach to work, we may not have everybody forever anymore. Right. So that's why we've taken the mentality of during their life cycle, let's have them just enjoy the, the heck out of it. Yeah, we, something you said absolutely resonated with me, which is the, you know, if you start to assess your turnover and you're assessing it at the back end, it's like looking at the end of a, you know, algebra, mathematical equation, but you don't actually look at anything. You're just looking at the result and trying to go like, where did I go wrong? It stems from, you know, it stems right from the very start, which is that vision, mission, culture, values. And that if you, you know, obviously it's such a critical thing for you guys. It is, you know, the, the lifeblood that 
you can also hang your hat on the fact that you've got all these, you know, long tenured employees. So it'd be really easy for someone externally to go, you know, that obviously makes sense if you're struggling, you know, and we see this quite a bit where there are clients that are struggling with that. It is, and it's exceedingly more difficult, I guess like this, and it's a great question for someone like yourself. How, how do you manage that like culture, vision, mission, for, and I know it's not blue collar, but it's your front line. It's the, you know, the feet on the ground versus the corporate. Cause it, it, it tends to be like different than that. And then even the blue collar, you know, I've got a buddy of mine. I use an example all the time as a cement truck driver. And he's like, where's my work-life balance? Where's my remote flexibility? Where's my right. employee well-being? Like, he's like, I don't get any of that. I don't care, but it's not even a discussion we would have. Cause like, you know, it's so, so you obviously have kind of a, of an in-between there, how how do you ensure that that corporate top down culture mission vision makes its way all the way down to the sixteen year old who's got their first job? Uh, we take the approach of meet people where they are, not where we expect them to be, because uh, we just celebrated the thirtieth anniversary of a delivery driver. So amazing for and, and he's part time. He's not full time. Doesn't want to be full time. But you go, okay, I, uh, next Wednesday, I'm selling the, celebrating the 25th anniversary of a delivery driver who works one day a week. Right. So we value what you do, where you are, for who you are. We don't try and put all these boxes around people. Mm. Um, at times, we try to have to check ourselves to say, are we talking from a white collar voice to a blue collar audience? Right. So my thing is, Go out to the floor, the manufacturing plant, the call center, the pizzeria, and just meet people where they are. You do that, that puts you far ahead. If it's uh, through dictates or processes or procedures or emails or postings, that human touch is gone. So uh, we are very much the, hi, how are you? Good to see you. And that's it. It's conversations for conversations. When people feel that they are truly heard, seen, and valued, and I don't mean new agey stuff, I mean real legitimate heard, seen, and valued, they'll stay. Yeah. I mean, the example with the driver is such a, a great one where I think a lot of organizations would say if there was someone who, you know, could only do one day a week, uh, but they were great. And if you could look 30 years in the future, find out that person would still be there. And it's because of a really positive, mutually beneficial relationship what would you do or suggest for someone where, you know, maybe I'm a small business and I've got, I need a, I need a full-time driver Monday to Friday and that's all I've got the space for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what seems the most comfortable would be to hire somebody who can do Monday to Friday, nine to five versus hiring two or three people to do the same job and maybe needing to then have overlap or like how, how can you get yourself to position where you, you can just hire the person who can do one day. Ooh, that's a big question. Uh, I, I think uh, it depends. Great HR answer. It really does depend. Sure. Um, however, in your example, if it's you must fit me and fit these parameters, it's back to your narrow thing. I can only hire because I can afford, but if you do the math, hey, I got to cover 40 hours. I have to have a 40 hour driver. No, you need to have coverage for 40 hours. How is that 40 hours covered? Right. Well, I can I can do a part time person here, a part time here, person here, or part time and see if they'll go to full time. Right. So there's ways to pull back. Or uh, the 25 year driver Jody, who's going to celebrate, uh, actually has a full time job somewhere else. She just loves the company, still wants to drive, so she drives two days a week. Right. For 25 years, you know what? I need that for 25 years. So I'm not trying to be everything to her. I'm allowing her to get what she needs from the company. And we value that in a smaller environment. I worked for a very, very small company um, where it was, this is what we have to offer. Then we understood that we were going to miss out on people because if people couldn't meet our requirements, they're kind of taking themselves out of the picture. It was a hard lesson. Uh, but after a while, we hit a certain balance and we started hitting it hard. But we had to kind of get through the cycle of what that looked like and not just demand to say, this is what's right. available. Can you do it? If not, okay, you know, I don't want to work second shift. Well, that's what we have. <laughs> Maybe even in that scenario where, I mean, you framed it so well, we need coverage for 40 hours, Monday to Friday from nine to five. And, you know, what's 
the greatest risk and the hardest to fill if the greatest risk is, you know, it's hardest to fill with right now a person who can do all 40 of those hours. And then if that person's gone, then you're left with nothing right. versus two or three people that, you know, maybe with current thinking wouldn't make the most sense because everybody out there wants a 40 hour job. But if you've got two or three people that, you know, you find just people who happen to, to align with, you still got that 40 hours, or maybe you're slightly over, but that if something happens, one person goes down, you're not back to zero, you're down to two instead of at three. And maybe you see if someone can help here or there, or at least your risk is, is mitigated. So maybe it's just a, a, a kind of revisioning of this is what my need is. And then let the market kind of dictate how you're going to solve the problem, which sounds like you guys are doing a lot of. Yeah. I, I think hiring for business need is different than filling recs. Yeah. Uh, now they can be the same. Yeah. So I don't want it to be an either or type thing, but if I know that hiring three people to cover those five, five, 40 hours meets our business need, fine. If I get that 40 hour person, still coverage, still got it. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, uh, Steve, I really appreciate your time. It's been an awesome chat. I, uh, I, a vision that down the road, we will have another one of these. I'm sure there'll be many topics we can discuss in the future. Awesome. Uh, if there was one lasting point, whether previously discussed on this or something we didn't touch on, like if you were to, to leave the viewers with something or the listeners with something, what, what would you say to them? I would love to see employers say that people matter. I don't know that we do that. All the good things that you're talking about, if I follow those three pillars, it shows that people matter. If right. they matter, they'll join your company. If they don't feel they matter, then why? What's the point? So HR people need to get past the process first and move it to people first with good processes in order to show people matter. And when you do that, you'll find people all day. Amazing. Well, again, Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your time. And uh, if anybody wanted to reach out, connect, we'll have their or we'll have your LinkedIn uh, connected below. Uh, if anybody wanted access to the newsletter, uh, how would they do that? What's the best way to 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 get access to it? This is where I'm a bit old fashioned. Yeah. Uh, email me because I want people to know what they're signing up for. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Uh, but we can get the email, put that in. We'll the have your, we'll have your link from there. below. And if anybody's interested, they could reach out and then look for that email to reach out and look to get access to it. Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you, Brent. Bye.